So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, composting and antibiotic uh, degradation today. Um, previous in my life, I do a lot of waste management, so I deal with biosolids, manures, uh, chicken guts, cow guts, anything that stinks or smells and crawls through the door, I, I deal with it can be recycled in, in either ag or urban stuff. So I get a lot of questions about ana anaerobic uh, degradation, so we decided we wanted to start a project. I've got a number of co-authors here. Uh, Shannon was a PhD student who was doing this, and she's actually here, so uh, you might want to corner her too. And I know she's got a also another presentation on degradation in uh, anaerobic digestion. Okay, so uh, in terms of antibiotics, we as a society have lots and lots of antibiotics out there. You know, somewhere uh, a zillion of them, and about 90% of it stays within our bodies and is then becomes excreted during things. And this can range anywhere from very little to very lot in uh, in, in manure. And for this study, uh, for introduction, we, we there's about 250 different types of antibiotics, 17 different classes, and the different classes have different sort of structural capacities, so they're sort of put it together like that. We only decided to look at three of them because that uh, um, it gets very expensive if you're going to start analyzing for all these things. You want to make it work. So we have three different classes. Uh, here that have different uh, different antibiotics, and here here are the different ones. These two are in, in one class. You can see that they have a K value that definitely differs in some of these, and water solubility differs in in these also from 5,900 uh, milligrams per liter down to about 344, 43 milligrams per liter. So large large diversity in this. So uh, it represents a number of different. Uh, classes. Okay, so here's some background information on the different uh, antibiotics we looked at, and we looked at here uh, degradation in either water, soil, or manure, and in or in composting in some of these there's uh, no data, and then for like in water there's no degradation at all of these. In soil we have, you know, somewhere short-lived between a couple of days and about a month or two, so they definitely Go and the question is for composting. Some of these there is no data in it or no degradation. And um, when it comes to composting, I'm sort of a stickler. I definitely uh, abide by pathogen destruction, hot composting, 131 degrees, uh, depending for three days or 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 for 15 days if you're doing a turn windrow. So um, a lot of these, when they're doing composting, they don't have any 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 explanation of what they're doing when they're when they're composting. So we looked at a couple of different materials, the fresh dewatered dairy manure solids we got from one of our local dairies. And then we also looked at biosolids, which is uh, material from a wastewater treatment plant that meets federal guidelines for uh, land application. It's what's considered a class B, if, which is partially treated. If you want to get to a class A, which is fully treated and you can use it anywhere, composting is a process used to get biosolids to a class A material. If you're not familiar with biosolids, separated biosolids, it's like a chocolate pudding. If you, when it comes out of the plant, it'll just sort of sit there and it'll sort of find its own level, two or three feet high, sits there. So it doesn't have much uh, airspace for composting. So what we did is, which is fairly typical for biosolids composters, you bulk it up with the wood shavings, uh, three to one, four to one ratio, depending on sort of the size of your wood product and what process you're using for creating your biosolids. So we use three, three to one here, and we just used a, a, Doug, a Doug, Douglas fir wood chip that I can get from one of my local uh, wood purveyors. Okay, so we use four composting treatments. They're basically a, a two by two factorial. We used either manure or biosolids, and then we either aerated the pile or didn't aerate the pile. So we have basically four different treatments. And what we did when we were mixing these, we picked rates that were similar to what's been found in manure or slightly less. And then for a couple of these, we need to, we need to bump it up just a little bit so we had enough, in the, enough of the material in the compost so we could track it through, through the system. Otherwise, it gets too little. Um, what we did is we would make the, uh, we have a manure spreader, which we use. It's also a compost mixer. Um, we use a lot, so we put down a third of the, of the mix that we had, either, either dairy manure or biosolids, wood chips. 
and then we uh, spread on the different uh, antibiotics, and we do this in three lifts. So we do one, do manure, compost, manure, or biosolids, antibiotic, manure, compost, biosolids, manure, wood chips, uh, antibiotic. And then we run it through the manure spreader twice. So we got to make sure we had a really good mixture of it. And we had a tarp out because I also deal with organic production, so I have to keep my biosolids separate from my organic, my organic stuff because biosolids is not an organic uh, registered material. Hence why I have the uh, tarp down. Also makes cleaning this stuff up a whole lot nicer. Um, and we mixed it three times. And then here are our little, uh, our little composting bins we use. This one. They're about a yard and a half, two yards, and they have an aerated static pipe in the bottom, which we'll get to in a minute, but they work really, really well. Um, we had aeration pipes in it. Here's the fans. We had two aeration pipes in the bottom of each of them, and uh, we put wood shavings around the aerated pipes that are in the uh, pile. If you don't use uh, a woody material around your aerated static pipes, the temperature next to your pipe will not be warm enough to meet pathogen destruction. Um, and then we fill the bill, fill the uh, once we had the pipe in and we had the plenum chamber in, we would fill fill them with the uh, fortified feedstock of uh, material, and we would use temperature probes at two 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 different depths, basically a high and a low one, and we just uh, record them every, every day uh, to make sure that we were meeting normal normal temperatures. And then in terms of the aeration period, what we would do is we'd go about 30 seconds on and then about an hour off. And that's sort of typical for the range of materials you use for, for this. If you're doing much bigger piles, you basically have to look at retention time uh, through this. So what happens is if you don't have any, uh, any, any aeration going through the bottom, you, get, you don't get uh, pathogen destruction. Um, you may don't get the temperatures. So here's... Uh, our different temperature profiles we have, we've got time on the bottom access temperature here. You can see that you got sort of two groups. We have the uh, manure, manure sort of maintain one at a little uh, higher and the biosols a little, a little, little lower. So oxygen concentration between them, this is sort of what you would expect where we aerated. We had more oxygen than where we did not aerate. And where you generally think about um, aerobic composting going on is sort of in this 5% range. If you're above 5%, you're generally aerobic. If you're under it, then you're uh, an anaerobic uh, composting. And uh, surprisingly, we did pretty good. Some of these have pretty good uh, you know, variation on them, but it's sort of typical of compost piles sometimes. So moisture content, again, these fit into two categories, no difference in the aeration, but they just sort of stay close to each other. And I don't, I don't find that surprising. Biosolids, when they make biosolids, it's the solid fraction and then a gel with it. So it's a little different kind of material. It's not a dairy solid, so I wouldn't really expect it to be, be the same. It's sort of its own, own unique material. Okay, so results on the nutrient concentration of what, what went on in this pile. Um, we looked at pH. We uh, have a couple of different classes. Again, we have manure that fits in one class, biosolids in another class, and within the manures, you know, they were all pretty close. We started at 8.2 and ended up at 8.5, 8.6, uh, sort of the same after 28 days. And with the biosolids, a little lower, but we definitely did drop uh, more with the biosolids with the pH than, than compared to the dairy manure. And carbon to nitrogen ratio, um, hugely important, generally during composting you'll see a drop and see the N ratio, which is generally good if you're going to use this material. So for the manure, we started out in the uh, about 30, 30 to 1 range, and we're down into, into the low 20s by the time we get to 28 days, regardless of we're aerating or non-aerating. And with the biosolids, we start off as lower C to N, because it's a different mixture. And uh, in this case, we went up a little bit. Um, I suspect these are all sort of about, about the same. Um, if you spend any time looking at nutrient analysis, biosolids is in a world of its own. It, it is always way different than any other type of manure I've ever, I've ever handled. Okay, so temperature reached between 65 and, 65 and 75 degrees 
The manure remained with uh, enough moisture, about 75 degrees biosolids, uh, dropped from 65 to 50% for moisture. pH values, 8.6 for manure, 6.2 for biosolids. And the finished compost, because they're different, one had a C to N ratio of 23, biosolids had 14. They're different kinds of materials, so I would expect that kind of differences. And, and if you're going to go to, to sort of land apply these, you would manage them sort of differently, too, because of their C to N ratio. Okay, so now we'll get down to looking at antibiotic differences. Generally, there were some minor differences in the way the, uh, they degraded. We have time on the x-axis and the concentration of the uh, antibiotic on the y-axis, and they all show very similar uh, trends. They come down, this is starting time zero. They quickly come down after about seven, seven days of sampling uh, to something very, very low, and then many of them just continue to uh, decrease. By the time we get out to 28 days, there's really not that much uh, left of the uh, compost. Here's sort of the changes in the actual numbers. You're looking at the percent reduction, and we start out here at seven zero days and, and where we start, and then you can see after seven days, the actual numbers here are very low. Percentage recovery, again, we have minor differences, 85, 90%, but generally really good uh, reduction in, in the amount we got, 21 days, and you know they're all in that 90, 95% uh, range for reduction. So really, I'm really happy with the way this is. I get a lot of questions, but which is really good. The uh, thing to keep in mind, though, we're only looking at three different classes. So there's a whole lot of other classes out there, 250-something antibiotics. There, I can't even imagine what it would take to, to, to look at all these in a composting <laughs> situation. So it's really huge. Um, and basically, the uh, manure and the biosolids facilitated uh, rapid degradation in our pilot scale compost systems. Um, 90 to 95% were removed after four weeks. And uh, what our conclusion was is that basically with these, you have minimal, uh, minimal human or ecological uh, health risk uh, if you use this for these, for these antibiotics during composting using a, a composting system like this. So. Any questions? I just had one. I couldn't find the room. What two antibiotics were you using? We're actually looking at four. Oh, okay. Let me. There we go. So there's the, they were in different classes, so they're, they're the different antibiotics. Can you, can you rule out that it wasn't just transformation to another form that you weren't measuring? Was this labeled in some way? or? No, it was not. It wasn't labeled. We were just looking. I suppose transportate. You could. We can't rule. We can't rule. Rule. Rule that out. But that can be said of any any compound. If you cleave off one carbon, it's right. going to be sort of different. It'll give you a, what, a little different what, answer. Did, how did you measure the antibiotics? That, how did you quantify that? Um, Aspect. You know, uh, this would be a question for Shannon. Okay. Okay. We can find Shannon. She'll know because she actually did a bunch of other research, not on the composting part of this looking at how much carbon was in the solutions and how that affected deg 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 degradation. So that really fell to her side of the uh, table. But I know she's here and she'd be happy to chat with you. This article has also been pub recently published, so you can get the, 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 the whole story in, in, in writing. How long will these antibiotics uh, last Well, it's, um, it depends what happens with your manure, you know, because if you're sort of taking this material and just sort of stacking it up and it warms up, you're going to get deg 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 degradation going on. So you'll get some exactly how much, I don't, I don't know. I expect it's going to go uh, somewhat quickly because it's showing that they, they came here and generally if you do a reasonable job with even just stacking up manure, assuming you have enough moisture, and enough uh, um, oxygen met, didn't matter. You know, you have enough moisture, but not too much moisture. It's going to heat up. It'll probably be okay. But I don't have. That's not what we looked at. So. It'd be interesting to see that, and from a land application standpoint, how long they would survive yeah. in just a pile in the field compared to this. Right. Sort of, sort of an, a, an aged, aged material. I, I didn't see your slide earlier. I couldn't. I, uh, so what we. Spiking samples? We, we were spiking samples with the. 
the at they were at what's usually found in manure or or biosolids. A couple of them. These two were a little higher because we need to make sure we had enough in there to to be able to track track the material. But these these were at ranges that you normally see in uh, in manure or, or biosolids. And so, I, of course, I know what time is in, but uh, the other two, what? I, I can't. I cannot tell you what yeah. exactly what what they're for. There's like a zillion of these, so. There, there, there are a number of materials that do break down and some that don't. So it just it depends on which which one one you're you're dealing with. Because I know ivermectin, that's one I get a lot of questions on, and it's not one we decided to look at. How broadly applicable would this be to each class? So, like, if we put in a different clinical, um, do you think do you, could you predict? Well, I would I would make make an assumption that because they're in the same classes, they should act reason, reasonably reasonably the same. But uh, you know, there there are 250 of them, so there are a fair amount of them. But I, you know, the, the ones that are in class, the classes are because they're similar chemically. Well, the tetracyclines vary a lot. Yeah. So, so maybe. Or tetracyclines, tetracyclines, yeah. they don't act similarly. I mean, they do broadly, but the persistence is different. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, I usually when I when I get questions, I what I tell folks that are using compost and such not generally they break down, but all of them don't. So some do and some don't, and that and that I think reasonably explains what we know about antibiotics. Some of them indeed degrade, and some of them don't. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay.